afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Abner, and I'm the technology consultant here at KDLA. Uh, today, we're talking about the E-Rate Form 471 for Category 1, uh, the first of two trainings on this particular E-Rate form. If you're looking at the full slides later, either posted on our website or within Blackboard Learn, uh, you will be able to navigate to different sections of this presentation using the links on the contents page, and there will also be a link to return you to the contents. Standard disclaimer, uh, anytime I'm doing E-rate training, I do want to remind folks that while I do my very best to present the most up-to-date and accurate information on the E-rate program, I am not the program administrator, which is USAC, the Universal Service Administrative Company, and I am certainly not from the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, which creates the rules for the program. Also, it's possible that after I give this presentation today, there may be updates to the E-Rate Productivity Center portal, so it's possible that what you see might be a bit different. So first, uh, before we get into the guts of filing a Form 471, let's talk about some important dates. So I know having so many different form numbers can be confusing, so I just wanted to take a quick step back uh, so that we're all on the same page about what needs to happen. So before you do the Form 471, you at some point filed a Form 470 for competitive bidding. And on that form, you made service requests. You told vendors that you wanted certain E-rate eligible services. You allowed them at least 28 calendar days to respond. You evaluated your bids, and then you selected the winning vendor. So the Form 470 was for service requests. Then the Form 471 is for funding requests. This is the point where you're telling USAC uh, which vendors you have selected for certain services, and you're providing all the details about that service and the cost and the contract period, if you have a contract. And then ultimately after review, uh, you hope to get a funding commitment for the amount that you requested, which will vary based on your discount rate. It's important to note that even if you didn't have to file a Form 470 because you had a continuing contract, or because you qualified for a competitive bidding exemption, you still have to file a Form 471 application every year of the contract or every year that you meet that bidding exemption in order to get discounts. So if you don't file a Form 471 for the relevant funding year, you're not going to get any funding uh, from that July to the following June, uh, the service dates covered by that funding year. You will be filing separate applications if you've asked for both Category 1 and Category 2 requests. Today we're covering the Category 1 form, and then next week we'll cover Category 2. So all of your application forms must be filed on Tuesday, March 22nd at 11.59 p.m. EST. So that's the original deadline to get in your application on time. We don't like to do this, but I will mention that there is a two week late filing grace period. So if you file within two weeks of the March 22nd deadline, uh, then you can ask for a deadline waiver from the FCC and those can be granted for really any reason. It doesn't even have to be a good reason. If you ask for it, uh, then you'll be given that uh, waiver. Otherwise, it would have to be something extraordinary, like there was a natural disaster, and that's why you couldn't file your form. Or unfortunately, perhaps the person who handled E-rate filing passed away. It needs to be really, really serious to get any exemption uh, beyond those two weeks. And we've got our E-rate funding years chart on this slide. You can go to the KDLA website to download a copy. So this is just, you know, giving you a heads up about various dates. If you look in that pale blue line, uh, should be the fourth row on the spreadsheet, it shows 
you the dates for funding year 2022 as far as when service begins. And it also shows you the dates for filing the Form 470, Form 471, and then the Form 486. Those are the three big forms that everybody definitely has to file at some point unless you've got that bidding exemption. So as a reminder, the competitive bidding deadline for the Form 470 is February 22nd, and then the deadline for filing the applications is March 22nd. Just as a reminder, we'll quickly review the E-rate eligible services list. You can download the full list from the USAC website. It's split into two broad categories. Category one covers connectivity to your building. So that would be an internet connection, or it could be some kind of data transmission circuit between branches. And in category two, which we'll cover next week, is about getting that connectivity to the devices in your building. So computers on your network, um, laptops or tablets accessing your Wi-Fi. So for category one, the time period we're concerned about is July 1st of 2022 to June 30th of 2023. Those are the service dates for recurring services. Basically, you know, when you're charged monthly or bi-monthly for something like internet access or bookmobile hotspot service. So under category one, uh, really just about any way you can get on the internet qualifies for E-rate as long as you're choosing the most cost-effective option to get your library the connectivity that it needs. So this could be fiber internet, cable, DSL. I suppose there are some states where libraries are applying for satellite internet, but luckily I don't think any Kentucky libraries have to. We do need to mention that for cellular data plans or hotspot service, the only um, entity that can get discounts on that service is the library bookmobile unless you can jump through many, many hoops to somehow prove that cellular data is the most cost effective option for a fixed location. So Kentucky libraries ask for a lot of cellular data. We usually have between 42 to 45 libraries asking for discounts on that service every year. I do want to mention that there are no particular limits on the amount of Category 1 funding that you can receive. So as long as you're asking for you know, the best solution for your library, uh, you don't have to stay within a particular amount because the cost could vary greatly between so many different entities. And then we won't spend too much time talking about Category 2, just as a reminder, especially if uh, you might need to file an additional Form 470. Category 2 covers pieces of internal networking equipment, licenses for those equipment, and also cable to connect that equipment to um, devices on your network. You can also request CAT2 discounts on basic maintenance of internal connections. That could be repair um, or upkeep, some kind of maintenance, software updates, patches uh, for your eligible internal connections equipment. And then lastly, under category two, there's managed internal broadband service where a vendor would be handling the daily monitoring and operation of pieces of your equipment, like the firewall, switches, and access points. Now, there is a miscellaneous category that could go under uh, category one or two. So there are some taxes or surcharges that are E-rate eligible. When we're talking about internet access, uh, depending on your vendor, you may have something like a federal access recovery charge on your invoices. Um, this is where carriers are uh, trying to recoup the costs of paying to access another carrier's uh, network in order to get the service to you. Also, if on your internet service, you have universal service fund fees or USF fees on your internet access, uh, those would also be E-rate eligible. I uh, don't really see that very often on uh, invoices for Kentucky libraries. If you have an invoice that includes your internet access and some phone lines, generally the USF 
listed on that invoice pertains to your voice service, your phone lines, rather than your internet service. Uh, you can also uh, request discounts on rental or lease, which of course would be category two, shipping, uh, training, and of course for category one, you may have a one-time charge for installing and configuring an upgraded internet service. So that can be included as your costs. As a reminder, the E-rate program can provide discounts on your primary internet access for each population. So E-rate will not fund an internet connection that they consider to be uh, backup, redundant, failover, or any of those kind of terms. So it needs to be the primary um, internet access for your library. Um, otherwise, if it looks like it's duplicative or duplicate, uh, then that portion of the funding could be denied. Now, it is possible for libraries to get discounts on two internet lines if one line isn't going to be sufficient to support all of the traffic on the network. So there are a few libraries that get discounts on one line that is for the public access, say for your public access computing and uh, Wi-Fi for the public, and then a separate internet connection uh, that is solely for staff. Uh, you still have to go through, you know, review for those kind of things. You will definitely receive questions. So you just need to make sure it's, you know, reasonably defensible that you really need those two connections in order to serve um, everyone at that particular location. And of course, good old SIPA compliance. So when you're filing for E-rate, um, almost everything you request will trigger compliance with the Children's Internet Protection Act or SIPA. So if you ask for category one internet access or any category two services, you must comply. The exception is for a service that is considered telecommunications in this case, transport only. So as an example, Lexington Public Library applies for discounts solely on the transport circuits that connect their branches. They separately pay for internet access and they don't get discounts on that portion. Therefore, Lexington Public does not have to comply with SIPA. But as far as I'm aware, every other Kentucky library must comply. Uh, we recorded an updated training on SEPA back in October. You can find that on the, e <laughs> the KDLA website in the uh, E-rate section of our archived webinars page. And of course, you're welcome to contact me directly if you have questions about SEPA. Now on to bid evaluations. You do want to make sure before you get ready to file that application form that if you did a bidding process, you do have a completed bid evaluation um, before you go certifying anything else. So for the Form 470 that your library filed, uh, there's an allowable contract date. And generally, the allowable contract date is 28 calendar days after the date that you certified the Form 470. So if you didn't specify a later due date, um, on that 28th calendar day, you'll receive an automated email from USAC that tells you that you can begin bid evaluations. So on that date, um, you would compare uh, any bids received for a particular service and then you know, use E-rate eligible cost as the primary factor in the evaluation. And if you didn't get any bids except your current monthly bill from your vendor, uh, you would just email yourself or save an evaluation where you state that on this date, you know, the library had received only one bid for the service, and therefore you're going with the one provider who uh, sent the bid. So um, after you have completed the bid evaluation, that is when uh, you can move forward with uh, making an agreement or signing a contract making sure, of course, that the contract is fully executed. 
So for some vendors, you might just be signing um, some kind of agreement and it only requires your library signature for the authorized representative. But if there are two signature lines, one for the library representative and one from the service provider, the contract is not fully executed until both signatures are on the document. Do you want to point out though that while the allowable contract date is generally 28 calendar days, you can certainly continue to accept bids after that point, um, you know, as long as you didn't state some other due date in your Form 470 narrative or in an RFP document. So the bids that you receive uh, could be new proposals, either from your current provider or potential new providers who can also provide that service. Uh, you could also consider your current monthly bill as a bid, unless you're requesting sealed bids as required by the Kentucky Revised Statutes. Uh, you also have the option to consider relevant state master contracts. As an example, if you filed a Form 470 for um, internet access, you might get a bid from your current provider and one competitor. You could also look at uh, the vendor or vendors on the state master contract. Um, that's certainly a perfectly valid way to handle your bids. Now, generally, you want to avoid having to communicate much with potential vendors, um, but sometimes you need to answer a basic clarifying question. Occasionally, it's just restating something or directing them to the RFP document that has the full information. If you've done a sealed bidding process, you may have included a deadline for vendors to submit questions in writing, and then you will upload an addendum to your RFP that will include the responses to all the requests, all the questions received by the deadline. So you need to be careful in whatever you say to the that you're not inadvertently changing the scope of your requests. So that would be adding functions that you didn't originally mention. It could be asking for bids for an internet service that is outside the range of bandwidth you listed on the service request, or it could be adding a location that wasn't originally mentioned. You need to be very cautious about that. Now, you may receive some messages that are spam where a vendor might say, you know, hey, we do some E-rate eligible services for category one and category two. Contact us if you want a proposal. You aren't obligated to respond to that message because your Form 470 and RFP documents, if you use them, uh, have all the information that the vendor would need to respond. So in selecting the winning vendor, as a reminder, you have to evaluate all the responsive bids and use E-rate eligible costs as the primary factor. So it will have the highest point value on the evaluation or the heaviest weighting on the evaluation. You can certainly consider other bid evaluation factors uh, at a lower point value. Uh, so very commonly, you'll have uh, some points assigned to whether the vendor or the bidder uh, met the specifications that you outlined for your request. So if you asked for a certain range of speed, they quote all of their options within that range. Uh, for category two, if you know you said you needed the vendor to include all of the equipment that you needed with certain specifications, of course you're going to assign a value based on how well they achieved that. This isn't really uh, relevant for category one, but you can also consider E-rate ineligible costs at a lower point value. That tends to be more relevant for category two. Um, a lot of libraries consider previous experience with uh, the vendor and whether or not the vendor can go ahead and apply discounts up front on your monthly invoices or for your one-time purchase since that would save you uh, the burden of having to file paperwork with USAC to be reimbursed. The vendor takes on that responsibility, bills you the difference that you actually owe, and then they've got to deal with USAC to get that money back. 
Again, if you've received only one bid in response to a service you listed on a Form 470, you still need to create an evaluation to note that. That way you have it documented, preferably in an email that's timestamped to show that you didn't just toss up bids. Um, you really only received the one and you're taking the only option that you have. You also have the ability to disqualify certain bids, but you must have stated the disqualification factors on the Form 470 or in the RFP document. Also, disqualification factors have to be binary, meaning they have a yes or no answer. The most common uh, disqualification factor used by Kentucky libraries is that the vendor has to have a service provider identification number or SPIN. You can't get your discounts from a vendor that doesn't have a SPIN, doesn't participate in the E-rate program. And again, just a more forceful reminder about being careful about your scope. So you need to make sure that whatever service you're going to list on the application form, you have, um, you know, for your funding request, you need to be able to refer back to a Form 470 service request that covers that function. So for 2022, if you're asking for discounts on any kind of um, internet, you know, fiber or non-fiber for uh, buildings, then you need to have a request for internet access and data transmission service, and also pay attention to the bandwidth that you listed. If you listed the max bandwidth that you wanted to consider as 500 megabits per second, you can't get E-rate discounts on this other great offer for gigabit internet because that wasn't part of your original service request. So when you reach the 28 calendar days for your allowable contract date, you'll receive an email from USAC uh, that will include a copy of their sample bid evaluation. It's also linked on the USAC website for you to access anytime. This is just an example. It's not the end all be all example, but it does correctly show a version where the E-rate eligible cost is the primary factor. Certain libraries can skip the competitive bidding process if they meet the business class internet bidding exemption. So you don't have to file a Form 470 for your primary internet line if the bandwidth for your service is at least 100 megabits per second download and 10 megabits per second upload or faster than that. That's just the minimum bandwidth. And then it just needs to provide basic conduit access to the internet at those minimum speeds. And then you need to be spending $3,600 or less per year per location uh, for that service. So that's $300 a month, uh, but you do need to be mindful of whether there are other charges that contribute to your internet that go into that amount. Um, that might include certain surcharges, it could include your static IP addresses, and then also installation. So all in needs to be no more than $3,600 annually per location. And of course, the service must be commercially available to other non-residential customers. But basically, if you have that service, <laughs> that means it's commercially available. So that's not really a sticking point. All right, now we want to talk a little bit about the information that you'll need to gather in order to successfully file a Form 471 application. So you need to double check or perhaps triple check that you have the correct SPIN or service provider identification number for any of the vendors you're going to list on the application. It's calmed down a bit in recent years. Um, there was a point where we were seeing a lot of changes due to mergers. So um, you should definitely refer back to the proposal to make sure that the spin they've listed is the one that you're going to be using. Um, as an example, uh, Bluegrass Cellular was purchased by Verizon. So for funding your 2022, 
all those customers who used to be on Bluegrass Cellular will instead be listing Verizon Wireless as their provider. You should also be careful if you're making an upgrade from a non-fiber connection, say like DSL, over to a fiber connection. Even for uh, some local providers, it might be that their uh, DSL service is under one company and they have created a separate company to handle the fiber requests. You should definitely, in that situation, contact the vendor to make sure you are referring to the correct spin for the correct company. It is possible to make some corrections later if you listed the wrong spin, uh, but that's time consuming and we really want to avoid that if at all possible. You also need to make sure you're aware of all of the charges for the service you're gonna be requesting funding for. So for a recurring service like internet, you need to know the monthly charges for that service. If you've got separate charges for static IP addresses, those are eligible as well. Um, it may be that you can include certain pieces of equipment. Um, for example, a charge for a cable modem is actually eligible under category one. Uh, again, universal service fund or USF fees. And then if you have something like the federal access recovery charge. Also, if you're upgrading to a new service and there's a one-time charge uh, to get that set up, um, then you certainly want to have those details to include. So your funding request can include the monthly charges as a line item, and then you'll have a separate line item for the installation. You also need to make sure you know how to correctly designate the service you're receiving. On the line item, you're going to be asked about the function. Uh, there are options like, like fiber, copper, wireless. So most libraries at this point are requesting fiber. And depending on your vendor, um, a lot of libraries will be saying that their type of connection is going to be ethernet. Uh, if you happen to be a customer of Spectrum, you're going to be listing the connection as OC hyphen N EDM fiber. And no, I do not remember what the abbreviation stand for. Um, if you choose a copper connection, you might be choosing something for the connection type like cable modem or uh, DSL. You also need to know the download and upload bandwidth for that particular service. So uh, later in the slides, there's a page where we've created a chart where it shows all the different functions you can select for internet access under category one, and then the connection types that are listed for each specific function. That way you can find the function that you might know and then determine, okay, here's the um, function that I need. All right, for contract records, I'm just gonna mention this really briefly because in a few minutes, I'll be doing a screen share and I will demonstrate how to complete a contract record. So if you have a service under contract or some kind of agreement, um, particularly one that you have to sign, you do need to create a contract record as part of your library's profile before you get to the Form 471 application. The reason you do that is that in the event that you have a multi-year contract, instead of having to re-enter all the details each year on the specific Form 471 application, you're instead, you have a separate record that you can refer to over and over again. And all of the paperwork, all that information is saved from year to year. So we'll go through a demonstration of how you might complete that form. Uh, do you want to point out that um, it's usually a good idea to upload a copy of the fully executed contract and even potentially information about the eligibility or some other details that your reviewer might want to know. That way it's all in one handy place and it could cut down or fully eliminate any application review questions. So I'm just going to skip past 
these particular slides right now for entering the contract. These are step-by-step -step instructions. And yes, there are several slides. It looks like there's a full 11 slides uh, to cover how to handle one contract. So now we'll talk about the discount rate a bit. So you may want to take a look at your profile and look at the tab for discount rate uh, to know what you could expect on the Form 471 application. Your discount rate with the E-rate program can change from year to year. It's determined based on whether your library system is overall considered urban or rural, and also the percentage of students in the local school district who qualify for the National School Lunch Program, which is free or reduced lunch. So as an example, good old Pioneer County Public Library has been filing since 2016. And all the years from 2016 through 2021, we qualified for a 90% discount. But this year, since um, fewer students qualified for free or reduced lunch, we have dropped into the 80% bracket. At some point before the um, profiles locked in advance of the Form 471 application window, the local school district went in and put in the data about the number of students enrolled in the district and the number that qualified for free and reduced lunch. So when you go to your profile and pull up the discount rate tab, your profile is automatically referencing the information from the school system's profile. If for any reason you aren't seeing a discount rate generated, let me know. We would need to work with customers just to make sure the system has all of the information required in order to determine your discount rate. And here's a copy of the discount matrix. So you can uh, take a look at where the brackets fall. Now for category one, the discounts are pretty similar um, in all the brackets, there is a slight advantage at certain points for rural applicants. And in Kentucky, uh, about three quarters of our libraries qualify for the top discount bracket for category one, which is 90%. Right, here's the portion we'll, where we will shortly start the walkthrough. I do want to point out in the slides that for those of you who have color vision, I have added different colors to the titles of each slide to help you keep track of where you are. So everyone will need to complete the basic um, information and entity information. And then I have different examples for things like starting a new contract for internet, referring to a continuing contract, or entering a service month to month like your local mobile hotspot service. So from this uh, guide to walk through slides, you can jump directly to the example that's most relevant to you. And you'll know you're in that particular section if you're able to see the color on the titles at the top of the slides. So in just a moment, I am going to uh, stop the screen share and then I will um, or I'll stop the file share and then I will share my screen. Okay, let's see. Here we go. All right. So the page I'm looking at right now is an ex a training portal for the E-Rate Productivity Center that mirrors what you see. Now the login page is a little bit different. For this training system, they don't have multi-factor authentication like you would normally see when logging into the portal, but otherwise it's a mirror of what happens once you get into the E-Rate Productivity Center. You know, go ahead and sign in. I've been assigned a particular account, it's not really my email. That's just one for these purposes. Otherwise, we have updated information in the system to make it really personalized. So it's all for the fake Pioneer County Public Library System in, I believe, Boonesburg, Kentucky. <laughs> we made up some information so it wouldn't look like another Kentucky system. 
Okay. So the first thing we want to do is look at the library's profile because we're going to add a new contract record that we'll refer to when we get into the application itself. There are two places where you can access the library system profile. So toward the upper left of my applicant landing page, you have the large USAC logo with blue boxes. Immediately below that, it says welcome, followed by your library system name. So that's one place you can click. You also have the option to scroll down to the section that says My Entities, and the System Build Entity Number uh, will be the first option listed. So either place will um, let you get into the profile. And for contracts, you do need to make sure you're saving it on the system profile and not to the profile of a particular branch. All right, so here we are on the profile of Pioneer County Public Library System. Just below the build entity number and system name, you have one to two uh, horizontal rows with links going across. You open on the summary tab that has basic information about where your library is located and a mailing address. We want to go over to the section for contracts. Now, on the contracts page, uh, you you may see a list of submitted contracts if you have been filing for E-rate for a few years. Again, all of the information from every contract record you've ever made since 2016 is saved in this section of your profile. So in order to start a new pro profile, you can click on the button at the upper right that says Manage Contracts. It's a white button. On the Manage Contracts page, you have a couple of options. So if you want, you can bring up a list of draft contracts. Uh, in this case, I don't have any drafts that I haven't completed, so there's nothing listed here. You could also look at copies of your submitted contracts. But what we want to do instead is add a new contract, so we'll click on the blue button. So the first field, and you can see your progress going along uh, the top of the page, uh, lets you know which section you are in the contract record. Uh, the first thing you'll enter is a nickname. And since you may end up having multiple contracts with the same service provider in different funding years, you want to, want to make it specific enough that when you see the name, you'll recognize we're purchasing with that contract. So in this case, um, I'll call this Pioneer County Telecom 2022. I'm going to add the word live demo at the end. So that is for the contract for my main branch with a local telecom. And then if your contract has a particular number assigned, uh, you can list that. This is not a required field and not every vendor will actually list a contract number. So I'm just going to go ahead and type in a placeholder there. And keep in mind, this is the contract number assigned by the vendor. Uh, once we continue, USAC is going to create a contract ID that just specifically designates this record in the E-Rate Productivity Center. Okay, and you can see now that I've continued to the next page that it's got the name of my library system near the top, it's got the nickname that I gave to this contract record. And then the contract ID is specific to the E-Rate Productivity Center. That doesn't have anything to do with a number that may have been assigned by your vendor. So on this next page, uh, they ask if you want to upload a copy of a contract. And that is almost always a good idea that can really cut down on application review questions. So I'm going to say yes. I want to upload a copy of my contract. And then I get a field below where I can either click on the upload button or I can drag and drop the file uh, to upload it in the system. I'm just going to click on upload. And luckily, I am already in the folder where I have my contract saved. I'm going to upload this signed PDF copy. Click open. And then it's added. If I made a mistake and I need to remove a document, I can just hover over the icon to the left and then click on the X. You have an optional field to the right where you can 
um, add more information. This may be especially helpful if the file name doesn't give a good idea of what's contained in the file, or if you've got multiple files you've uploaded. It could be something that is useful to you, um, but possibly it would be you know, a bit of instruction or context for your reviewer. That way they know exactly what they're looking at. So for an example, I might type in that this is a three-year contract with two voluntary extensions for the main branch internet. So that just gives, gives me an idea of what's going on here. And then you can see that I also have another upload field. So you can only upload one document at a time, uh, but you have to keep getting more options to upload additional documents. As a reminder, for the contract itself, all of the pages need to be in one file. So if you got them printed on separate pages or for some reason you've got, um, you know, a proposal on one page and a page where you signed in another file, you want to make sure those are together in one complete document. You can't just upload, here's a picture of one page, here's a picture of another. It needs to be an entire Word document, an entire PDF. Uh, for that contract. And if you need help making that, uh, please let me know. I'll be glad to assist. Okay, on to the next page. So the next page has a couple of questions about um, you know, how this contract was set up. So it, with one exception, Kentucky Libraries will be saying that no, their contract isn't based on a state master contract. The only one that you might list is if you're buying off the Kentucky Information Highway State Master contract. And then is this contract based on multiple award schedule? So again, that's something at the state level that's kind of common where they could you know, select multiple vendors who can fulfill um, the scope of the requests for that particular contract. But most likely you're going to be answering no. All right, the following page, you've got more questions about that contract. And the first question, can other applicants piggyback off the contract? Uh, that means maybe you created the contract, but perhaps other local government entities are allowed to purchase from it. Uh, one example would be that uh, Louisville Metro government may have uh, created a contract for Louisville Free Public Library that sets up pricing that any other Kentucky library can purchase from. Um, it's not something we've really listed for E-rate purposes, but it may be possible. But most likely you're going to say no. And once you respond, you'll get another question. Are you piggybacking off someone else's contract? Most likely the answer is no. Save and continue. All right, and then on to bidding information. Uh, you need to um, enter the number of bids that you received, keeping in mind that it may be, you know, one bid that you've received. So you do need to list that. In this case, I have three that bid, bids to consider. And then going back to the left-hand side, did I post a Form 470 for the services? Why, well, yes, I did. Once I say yes, uh, if I look below, um, there will be a section for searching for FCC Forms 470 that I have already filed. So I don't have to type anything um, into the search fields. I can just go ahead and click on the white search button. And then when I scroll down, I'll have a grid showing various results. Now, obviously, I have a lot of results, over 100, because We've been creating many, many, many examples of Forms 470 since 2016. Uh, likely, your library will have only one to two pages. Uh, if you look at the lower left of the grid, you can see that I'm looking at results one through five of 101. So you can use the arrows to uh, jump to other pages or skip to the very end. You also have the option to sort the results uh, using um, you know, information like which funding year it pertained to or what the allowable contract date was. So in this case, I'm going to organize it so that it shows the funding year 2022, the most recent forms first. 
And in this case, um, I'm going to select a form I filed that included the request for monthly internet access and hotspot service. So I'm going to check the box to the left of the correct form 470, and then I will save and continue. For the service provider number um, or the account number, if you have one, you can list it. This isn't required. Obviously, if you're switching to a new provider, you may not have that information. It's also possible if you're upgrading service, uh, you may be assigned a new account number from your service provider. So feel free to skip this if you're not sure. I'm just going to go ahead and enter my account number here. And then we have the field to search for service providers. I highly, highly recommend that you search by the specific spin rather than the name because there could be a lot of results for similarly named companies. And sometimes companies will have spins that are only differentiated based on which state uh, that company is working in. So it's really easy to select the wrong spin in this way. It's much better to check with your service provider and use that particular number. In my case, since this is a test system, um, I'm not going to be using a real spin for a real provider. This is just a made up USAC provider. So let me type in this number. When I click on search, I'll get uh, results for USAC service provider organization one. So once I find the correct provider, I'm going to check the box to the left of the result and I'll save and continue. And then we'll get to a section for the contract dates. Now your cursor starts on the right hand side. The award date is generally the date that you signed the contract or if the vendor signed at a later date, you know, you could potentially list that date. Usually it's the same date for both. So in this case, uh, the contract was signed on January 31st, 2022. And I'm going to say that, yes, this is a multi-year contract. So um, unless it's strictly 12 months, you do want to check that option if you're going to continue to refer to this contract in future funding years. On this next page, since um, you know, it will ask if I have voluntary extensions. Now that's pretty, pretty rare for Kentucky libraries. Not too many contracts have voluntary extensions, but in this example, I'm going to say yes, just so you can how you would enter that information. So the first is, what is the contract expiration if all extensions are exercised? So in this case, I've got a three-year contract with two voluntary extensions. So that expiration would be um, June 30th, 2027. If I can type 2027. <laughs> and you're listing that even though you have not yet exercised those extensions. So at this point, since I've not exercised any, there are still two extensions left. And the total length of the contract that remains if all the extensions um, have been used is going to be 60 months or a full five years. Okay. Then for pricing confidentiality, generally pricing confidentiality is not allowed by the E-rate program. Occasionally that comes up for, you know, big special construction charges for building a whole new network. There may be proprietary information along with that pricing that cannot be shared publicly. But for the overwhelming majority of you, you're going to say that there aren't any restrictions either by law or by the contract itself uh, that would prohibit your specific pricing information being published you know, in a public database where other people can see it. So I'm going to say no. When I save and continue, it's going to take me to an overview page. So this is the page where I can look back at all of the information I requested or I entered on this particular contract record. If I notice that mistakes were made, I can click the back button to return to previous pages. The system will hold on to all my responses. But when you're ready, uh, you need to click on the complete button. This contract record will not be available to reference on the application form until it is complete. So I'll click. 
And now you can see that that is listed as the first contract under submitted contracts for my library. So I know that took a chunk of time but we want to make sure we covered that completely since that's a very important step and many libraries have internet contracts. We're now going to return to the landing page so we can start a Form 470. So to get back to the landing page, you can click on Reports in the big blue menu bar at the top of the page. Under Reports, you have a link that says My Applicant Landing Page, or you can click on the USAC logo in the blue boxes. Either one will take you to the landing page. Now, the easiest way to start a new form is to look at this cluster of links toward the upper right of the page. In the first row, there's a link that says FCC Form 471. Anytime I click on that link, it's going to create a new form in another tab in my browser. And I just want to point out, since this happens quite commonly, if you click on that link accidentally, thinking, oh, I'm going to look up a form I've already done. You do want to make sure if you don't really intend to complete this application form that you go ahead and use the discard form button at the lower left. Because if you don't discard this, it's going to remain on your task list. And then every few weeks, the system will bug you and say, hey, do you want to finish, you know, go certify this form 471? And that can be confusing if you didn't intend to create this other form. In any case, looking at the Form 471, uh, your library name and build entity number will be listed at the top of each page. And then you have this progress bar that shows you uh, which major section you're in uh, for the application. The profile information about the physical location of your library, your build entity number, etc is pulled from your library's profile. If information is incorrect, you can't edit the profiles right now. They are locked during the application window. You can make notes on your application when you get to the funding requests about changes that need to be made, or I can assist you with submitting a modification request so that we really get the reviewer's attention to fix an address or something like that. So the first field you enter is the application nickname. This is simply for your reference. So do what works for you. In this case, I'm going to call this FY 2022 category, well, category one, and I'm going to add live demo. So this is going to include all of my library systems category one requests including the main building internet under that new contract record I just made. Uh, a branch library will be continuing under a contract that was signed in a previous funding year, and then we'll be month to month with our bookmobile hotspot service. Save and continue. You'll hear me say that a lot. On the next page, if you had a consultant who was filing on your behalf, obviously they would be doing this for you. Their information would be listed here listed here. Since you are handling the filing yourself, you'll skip down to contact information. And if you're the main contact, you can say yes. If you say no, you have an ability to search for other staff members who have an account in the E-Rate Productivity Center tied to your library. But for most of you, if you're creating the form and completing it, you're going to list yourself as the main contact. Below that, there's a field for holiday or summer contact information. While most of you will have your funding commitments, uh, you know, before the funding year begins in July, um, you know, a lot of the participants in this program are schools where the staff member may not be available, you know, during the entirety of the summer. So in this case, you want to make sure to list some information for your reviewer. You could copy paste your profile information that appeared at the right, or you could retype something. So in this case, I'm going to put my name, my correct work email, and then my phone number. I really prefer if libraries don't leave this blank. And then I will save and continue. On the category of service page, you have to select the one category of service that you're going to include 
put on this application. Recall that on a Form 471, you can either file Category 1 funding requests or you can file Category 2. You can't include uh, both categories on the same form. So in this case, I'm going to click on the Category 1 button so it turns blue. And once I click on Save and Continue, the category of service for this application is set and it cannot be edited. So if I made a mistake, I would need to discard this form and start a whole new one. Save and continue. Okay, next is some information about our entity. So in this case, it's pulling some information from the system profile, but also listing which school district my library is located in. So as well as the square footage. So again, if any information here is wrong, you're going to have to uh, get the reviewer to fix this information later because right now you can't change the profile information yourself. Save and continue. All right, on the related entities page, many libraries won't have any related entities listed if they're an independent library with one main branch building and that's all. But if you're a system that has several branches, in this case, we've got the main branch, got a branch library in Loganville, and I have a bookmobile, uh, there are separate entity numbers to designate each of those different branches of my library system, and that's why they're listed on this page. So you're seeing some details from the specific profiles of those branches. And then if you had an annex associated with a branch, uh, you could view that. An annex is uh, something like, say, a building that's located next door to a branch uh, that isn't really a separate address. It's not really you know, a separate location. It's all kind of part of the same campus. I'll put it that way. There are a few libraries that have annexes. It's also possible if you have something like a kiosk location that isn't staffed, that could be listed as an annex of whichever brand branch it's associated with. And that's becoming more common for Kentucky libraries. When I'm ready, I will save and continue. And that will bring up the requested discount calculation. So this is the information that I saw earlier in my profile. I see the school enrollment for the district, the number of students who qualify for the National School Lunch Program, and therefore the percentage of students who qualify for that program. I know that my system is considered overall rural, and that puts me in the 80% bracket for Category 1 Internet. If I wanted to see some additional information, uh, when I click on the Show Additional Information, it will show me the uh, branches that contribute to um, whether the status is overall rural or urban. So in this case, my main branch and my bookmobile are both considered rural and therefore the majority of my system is rural. If you have an equal number of rural and urban branches, the discount rate is then determined by whether the main branch is rural or urban. Now when I save and continue, I will be going to the main funding request page. One moment while I take a drink. Okay, so this is where the bulk of the work happens on the form. We're going to go through this process three times, uh, one for the main building internet under a new contract, again for the continuing contract for my Loganville branch library, and then one more time for the book wheel hotspot service that is month to month. Each time I create a funding request, it's in really two parts. Uh, when you add the FRN, you'll answer some initial information um, about how you're making the purchase, you know, the dates that are covered for a contract, as an example, a narrative description of, you want, of what you want. You will then have to add at least one line item to the funding request uh, number in order to complete the process. You may potentially have more than one line item. So to get started, I'm going to click on this blue Add FRN button. And the first page I see is funding request key information. And it's asking me in the first field to enter a nickname just for this particular funding request. 
And this is useful because if you have multiple FRNs or funding request numbers on your application, it'll make it easier for you to look at the list and say, oh, that's the request for the main branch. That's for the Loganville branch. That's for the Bookmobile. So in this case, I'm just going to say it's main branch internet. And some of the information is popping up below as a suggestion because I completed a version of this application to create the slides today. So I've answered that information about my nickname. The question below that asks if this is a continuation of an FRN from a previous funding year. So if you were continuing you know, a multi-year contract, you may say yes here and list the previous funding request number from funding year 2021. Since this is a brand new contract for an upgraded service, I'm going to say no. It's not a continuation. This is a new thing. We're going to skip the copy FRN function in this particular instance. We'll see an example of using copy FRN for the next funding request. And then under service type, for category one, there is only one service type, data transmission and or internet access. So, that's a, so the selection was made for me. So I'm ready to continue. The next page for FRN contract uh, really just should say purchase type. You're telling USAC how you're making this purchase. So you have an option to click on contract, tariff, or month to month. In this case, I made that contract record. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the contract button so it turns blue and continue. The next page is for associating or linking that contract to this funding request. So by default, my field entity number is already entered and I can click on search to see the list. If I wanted to narrow it down um, and I knew something like the nickname um, you know, for that contract or I knew the EPC contract ID, I could use that to narrow things down. But in this case, when I click on search, it conveniently shows the most recently created applications first. When you find the one that you want to reference, you're going to check the box to the left. So in this case, I'm going to look at Pioneer County Telecom 2022 live demo. When I check the box to the left and scroll down, the summary information from that contract record I made is pulled into this funding request. So then I need to enter some information about the dates. Now, by default, the service start date will be listed as the first date in the funding year, which is July 1st, 2022. The other um, field for date asks for the contract expiration for the current term of the contract. So in this case, I have a three-year contract that has two voluntary extensions, but since I haven't yet exercised those voluntary extensions, I'm just going to list the original contract expiration, the three years. So in that case, um, that should be June 30th, 2025. <laughs> yes, I know how to calculate three years. June 30th of 2025. Then I can continue to the next page. For fiber request key information, it's asking for something that, as far as I'm aware, no Kentucky library needs. So that could be special construction. It could be equipment to light fiber in the first place. It could be certain network um, maintenance. So you're going to answer no on this particular question. And then continue. In this last section of the FRN itself, you're going to be giving a really brief description of what you're requesting. Now, keep in mind that you're going to have a lot of details and line item, so you don't need to write an essay here. I'm just going to put monthly internet for the main branch with one time installation in this particular case. Again, I don't need to say it's fiber and it's this bandwidth and all of that because I'm going to get into all those details in a moment. So when I'm ready, I want to use the blue button to save and add manage FRN line items because I need at least one line item to finish this funding request. 
So this takes me to the line item page. And you can see I don't have any yet. And for each line item, I will create it separately by clicking on the blue button. This is add new FRN line item. All right, for product and service details, um, if you're asking for internet access, uh, almost every single library will just be selecting the first purpose, which is internet access service, and includes a connection from any applicant site directly to the internet service provider. So that's pretty much what any single building might have. There are a few libraries that might uh, be asking for data transmission between library branches. That might be a separate service for them. But when in doubt, do the first purpose. For the function dropdown, I've got uh, several options, uh, fiber, copper, wireless, um, other, and miscellaneous. So in this case, it's a fiber connection. I'll click on fiber, and then I will list the type of connection. Now, there's a, a list of several different options that describe you know, the type of fiber strand or how that service is actually being connected to you. So uh, when in doubt for a fiber service, the best option is Ethernet. That is the most common option. So once I've entered the type of connection, I can save and continue. As a reminder, that chart that shows you all the options for the functions and types of connection is on slide 67 of the presentation. The next page is for bandwidth or your internet speed. In the first box, you're just going to put a number for the bandwidth itself. So the new service for the main branch is 500 megabits per second download. I enter 500 in the first box, select the unit megabit per second or Mbps below. The system assumes that I have the same upload speed. In this case, that is accurate, but it's possible you might have a connection that isn't symmetrical and you might need to change what the upload is. You also have a question to the right about burstable bandwidth. That's where you may get access to additional bandwidth at certain peak times of day at an additional cost. I'm not aware offhand of any libraries in Kentucky that are using this, so I'm going to say no. And I'll save and continue. And there's connection information for this particular line item. And the first question is, is this a direct connection to a single school or library? And in this case, it's internet access service, and it's got a connection to that main building. I'm going to say yes. If you say yes to this first que question about direct connection, you must answer no to the question below, that it's not a wide area network. So again, most Kentucky libraries will say yes on this first question, no on this uh, second question. And then to the right, does this include firewall service? They're asking if the internet provider actually does the firewall service for you, not whether or not you own your own firewall. So in this case, we're going to answer no. Save and continue. That brings us to the dreaded cost calculation page. So I know it looks like a lot. And it could do with some better formatting, but it's really not too bad. So you've got fields to complete on the left-hand side involving the monthly costs, and then the right-hand side for one-time costs. And you have to complete all of the fields, even if you're putting zeros in some of them. If you don't complete all of the fields, then the system can't calculate the total cost for the line item. So in this case, starting on the left, for the monthly recurring unit cost, uh, my library's internet is, I think, $650 a month. So that's just the pre-discount cost of the service. It's all entirely eligible. For the monthly recurring unit ineligible costs, if for some reason you had a product that you were getting that wasn't fully eligible, uh, you might say, this portion of the cost every month isn't eligible. That's not relevant here, so I'm putting zero. Monthly quantity, you're putting the number of lines or circuits um, that have this $650 a month charge. In this case, it's one for my main branch building. So then the system calculates, here are all the monthly costs added up for the 12 months of service that you're going to receive during the funding year. 
Now on the right hand side for one time cost, I'm not going to put the installation that needs to be on a separate line item. So I'm just going to put zeros. I don't have any other one time cost for my monthly internet service. So the system then calculates the total cost as $7,800 pre discount for the entire year. I'll save and continue. The page after that is managing recipients of service. If you're an independent library with only the one entity number, there's nothing to do on this page because it's already been managed for you. If you have multiple libraries, you'll either need to indicate that yes, all of the entities are receiving this service, or you're going to answer no, which is what I'm doing in this case. And then below in the grid with the uh, build entity numbers and names, I need to select which branches are getting this service. I will check the box to the left of the name branch, and then I'm going to click on this little blue add button to the right, and then that entity appears under selected entities. I don't need to check any additional boxes unless I made a mistake and need to remove something. So I'm ready to save and continue. The next page confirms that the recipient of service for this line item is in fact the main branch. When I save and continue, that will return me to the line items page. Now I've got one time installation, so I'm going to complete another line item really quickly. So you do have to answer the questions a bit awkwardly uh, for some of the things like installation, uh, because you still have to answer some questions that make it look like you're talking about the internet service itself just go with it because you have to have responses in all the fields. So I'm again going to say the purpose is internet access, but this time the function I choose is miscellaneous. And for the type of connection, I can choose installation, activation, and initial configuration. I'll save and continue. Now I'm going to go pretty quickly through this. I will again select the speeds, answer no on burstable bandwidth, and continue. And yes, it's a direct connection. No on these other two questions. Save and continue. Now this time, since it's a one-time cost, I'm going to put a zero in all the boxes on the left-hand side of the page. In this case, for the one-time unit cost, it costs $250 for the installation of my new internet. None of those costs are ineligible. I put zero. And I've got quantity one of that installation. So then the calculation for this line item is $250 pre-discount. I'll save and continue. I will again quickly indicate that the main branch is the recipient of this service. Save and continue. There's the confirmation. And back to the line items page. So now I've got all my line items completed. When I save and continue, that's going to return me to the main funding request page. And you can see on the funding request page that you're starting to build a grid with all of your funding requests. And the FRN calculation shows that based on the cost of all the line items, and then with your discount rate applied, you are asking the program to give you $6,440 for the year as your 80% discount on that main building internet. Okay, now we're going to go through a couple more examples. It will go more quickly. I'm going to add another FRN, and this time I'll say uh, branch library continuing contracts. In this case, since it's a continuing contract, I'm going to go down and use the copy FRN feature. I'm going to ignore the second question for now. When I click on copy FRN, that will bring up a new page where either I can search for the application from last year or I can search for the funding request number. Of course, I want to search for that funding request number. So in this case, I have entered the number from a previous year. I'm going to need that number again in a minute. So I'm going to highlight and copy it. And then I'm going to click on search to have the system bring up the result. When I find the correct FRN to copy, I'll check the box to the left, click on continue, and confirm that I want to continue. It will take the system 10 to 15 seconds to pull all the data from last year. This is going to save us a lot of time. We do have to re-enter the service date and the contract expiration, um, but really it's pulling all of the information from the previous year. So I'm not having to redo all the line items. I'm not having to redo the entire narrative. I'll click on refresh 
I get a notice that my funding request has been copied successfully, and I'll continue. That returns me to funding request key information. Now, because I'm under a continuing contract, I'm now going to change the second question. I'm going to uncheck no and select yes, that this is a continuation from a previous year, and I will paste in that funding request number. The rest of the page is ready, so I continue. And you'll see that most of the fields will already be entered as we go to different pages. It's already identified as a contract purchase. The next page, if I look at the top of the page, it's got the contract summary for the record that I made back in 2020 when I originally signed that contract. But because I use CopyFRN, I have to list the service start date and then, of course, the current contract expiration. So in this case, the service start date, I'll just enter as July 1st, 2022. And the contract expiration for this is going to be June 30th of 2024. So again, I haven't, in this case, exercised some extensions. So that's the current contract expiration, and I'll continue. This page about fiber request key information is answered. Continue. And then the narrative. And there's not anything I need to edit. If your last FRN included installation, you have note in here, you might want to take out that reference in the narrative. But otherwise, I'm just going to go to the line items page, take a quick look, and make sure that everything that I need is still there. So in this case, uh, there's one line item that's just the cost for the monthly service itself. You might have a second line item, something like installation. Once you get to the second, third, fourth year of contract, uh, obviously you're not doing that one-time installation charge again. So you may need to check the box to the left of a funding request number or line item number, and then you can remove that line item. But that's not necessary this time. I think we're on year three of this contract for the branch. So uh, everything is good to go, and I can save and continue. So now I've, I'm back on funding request, and my grid has two results. So I've got one more funding request for the month-to-month -month bookmobile hotspot service. So we'll add FRN, and I will just call this Bookmobile Hotspot. I'm going to say no, it's not a continuation. This is an under contract. It's month to month. And then the service type is already selected for me, so I continue. On the next page for the purchase type, I select month to month and continue. In this case, for the number of bids received, I'm going to say I had two offers. And then I have to answer the question, did I post a Form 470 for these services? I'll say yes. Then I will get the Search FCC Forms 470 section below. And I can go ahead and click on the white search button to bring up a list of all of my Forms 470. I, again, will just reorganize uh, the list, resort, and I will find the 2022 form that included the Bookmobile Hotspot service on it. Then I'll continue. On the next page for service provider information, I can put in an account number. So I'm just gonna quickly type something in. That's only if you have the correct account number. And then once again, I'm going to need to search by spin to find my provider. So I will go ahead and take a quick look I can remember the service provider number for this um, zero one. I hope that's the correct spin. Okay, good. So in this case, I'm choosing fake USAC service provider number three. Check the box to the left and continue. I've got the start date and en entered on this page for dates. The expiration is going to be June. 30 or the services will end on June 30th of 2023. So those are the normal dates for the funding year. And I'll continue. For pricing confidentiality, I'll answer no and continue. Now it seems odd that the fiber request key information comes up when you know you're dealing with the bookmobile hotspot service, but you haven't gotten to the line item page where you indicate it's cellular data. So that's why this page appears. 
obviously I'm going to say no, it's not even for service and continue. For the narrative um, for this request, it might be unlimited monthly data for the library bookmobile. So you definitely want to mention something about bookmobile. You're going to repeat that several times because otherwise the reviewer is going to be like, why are they even bothering to look this? Kentucky requests a lot of cellular data. That's actually very rare in other states. I think in the United States for E-rate, we're the biggest requester uh, numerically of cellular data for bookmobiles because we have the largest fleet in the United States. Go Kentucky. My narrative is complete, so I'm going to click on the blue button to save and add manage FRN line items. This time, I'm just going to be adding one line item. I'll click on the blue button to add a new FRN line item. So again, I've got product and service details. The purpose for cellular data will again be the first purpose for internet access service. This time for the function, I will choose the option for wireless. And for the type of connection, I will then choose data plan for portable device. And I will save and continue. Now, the weird thing when you're doing the cellular data line item is that you have to translate the speeds into megabits per second, just like if you were in your library building. So you don't have an option to say this is 4G, LTE, 5G. You've got to maybe do a speed test or maybe your provider has told you what the speeds are supposed to be. So most libraries will end up having something like 10 megs as the download speed, although hopefully that's gotten better over the years. In this case, the cellular service isn't going to get the same on the upload. That's going to be slower. I'm going to put that as one megabit per second. I will also answer no on burstable bandwidth and save and continue. So is it a direct connection? Yes, it is a direct cellular connection to the library's bookmobile. So I'll answer yes. I will say no on the other two questions. Save and continue. On to the cost calculation page. So in this case, uh, the data portion of my plan is $39.99 a month. I don't have any recurring costs. And perhaps in this case, I have two hotspots on the bookmobile. Maybe I'm doing circulation on one hotspot, staff functions, and the other is used for uh, patron Wi-Fi along the route. So if I enter that, it's going to calculate the, the total monthly amount and then the total amount for the year. And of course, this is just a service I've had before, new setup fees, I'll enter zeros for one-time costs. I'll save and continue. And then for managing the recipients of service, I'm going to change the answer to this first question to no. It's not every branch in my system getting us. In the grid of results, I'll check the box to the left of the Pioneer County Bookmobile. I'll click on the blue Add button. There it is under Selected Entities. I'll save and continue. And the next page will confirm that the recipient of service is the Bookmobile. Save and continue again. And that will return me to the line item page for this funding request. I don't have any additional line items, so I will save and continue. That brings me back to the funding request page. Now all three of my funding requests are completed. I am now ready to review FCC form 471. And so I'm going to click on that button and confirm that I want to proceed in generating that draft PDF copy of the form. I'll say yes. And then I'm going to need to give the system 30 to 60 seconds uh, to create that. Uh, when enough time has passed, I'll click on the blue refresh button, and then there'll be uh, an option on the page to download and open um, that PDF copy. So if you are filing this yourself rather than during an appointment with me, uh, it would be a good idea to email me a copy of your Form 471 or to let me know it's ready to look at. I do have overview access for in-process forms 471, so I don't actually need the PDF copy, but you should notify me so I can review your form before you complete the certifications. I'm going to go ahead and click on refresh, and now you can see the page has changed 
uh, so I've got download document link. If I wanted to look at the draft, I could click on the link. And when my computer wants to, I'll go ahead and download this. And then if I wanted, I could just open up this draft copy. I don't need to keep this version for my records. After I certify, I'll get that, that copy. So um, this form can be a little bit uh, difficult to scroll through if you, you're not super familiar with it. Um, but it's going to go you know, through every single uh, funding request number, will be uh, separate pages for recipients of service and each line item. So it may end up being you know, quite a long document, even though you don't think you're requesting very much. So um, everything I think you know, is going to look OK on here. You might look at the FRN calculation for this first funding request. So you can see that the system is calculated. Here's the overall cost for my monthly main building internet and that one-time installation cost. So it's going to cost $8,050 for the entire year for that service. With my 80% discount, I'm asking for uh, the program to commit $6,440 to me as my 80% discount. I'll get that discount as I actually pay for and receive services. If it ends up costing less than expected, I'll just get my 80% discount on what I actually paid. So this is a commitment, not an ironclad guarantee that that full amount of funding will end up in your library's account. I'm satisfied with the draft, so I will close that. Back on the page with the download document link, I will check the box below to say the information is correct. And then I will click on the blue button to continue to certification. On the certifications page, um, you're going to be doing a lot of certifications. If you want me to go through those with you and kind of explain what they mean, I will be glad to do so. I need to check the first two certifications that indicate that my library is eligible and that I'm budgeting for technology spending to make effective use of the internet service I'm getting E-rate discounts on. That becomes relevant in the total funding summary. This section um, first lists the pre-discount eligible cost of all of the services on my three funding requests. It then lists the total funding commitment or that 80% discount on the total eligible cost. And therefore, it shows me 20% of the eligible cost that I'll actually need to pay out of pocket. Now, this fourth line, the total budgeted amount allocated to resources not eligible for E-rate support, this is where I'm going to be listing that technology budget. So if you're not sure what to include, look at this second certification. It's talking about things like computer training, software, your internal networking equipment, maintenance, et cetera whatever you need to make effective use of those internet services. So a lot of libraries will just have a technology line item in their budget that they'll list here. So I need to change the zero dollars to, in this case, I'm going to say 25,000. And then the system calculates that if I'm spending 25,000 in my general tech budget and I'm going to be paying 20% of the costs of my eligible services, that overall, my spending for all this technology, including my internet, is going to be $28,301.95 per year. Then there are two questions about service providers. You will answer no on both. It's really important you answer no. Otherwise, you'll get some pesky questions because it may seem like uh, perhaps your service provider has been providing more assistance than they were <laughs> really supposed to. Uh, so you want to avoid, and that's not what's happening with Kentucky Libraries, so make sure you answer no. Be careful when you start scrolling that you don't change the response. I will then check all the other certifications going down the page. It pertains to the program rules and document retention. We're not going to work with people debarred from the uh, E-rate program. It looks like I missed one. Oh, sorry, I missed the second one. Okay, once all my certifications are checked, I'll click on the blue certify button. And on the pop up, I'm saying, yes, I know I can be prosecuted for making false statements on this application. And I am authorized to represent the entity, meaning Pioneer County Public Library System. Well, yes, I am. You will immediately see a certification confirmation page. Now, if you scroll down a bit, it's really tempting to immediately 
follow this link that says click here to access the PDF copy. However, I would instead advise you to go ahead and close this page. If you don't close this page, this will remain on your tasks list and then you start getting pesky reminders. Also, if you immediately follow that link, your PDF copy isn't going to be ready yet. You might as well clean up your tasks list and then navigate to the form 471. So I'm going to close and then I'm going to return to the landing page by clicking on the USAC logo. On the landing page, I'll scroll to the very bottom for looking up uh, FCC forms. I'll change the form type to the 471 and the funding year to 2022. In the results, I'm going to click on the form with the nickname that says Live Demo. Just click on that application number. And this takes me to the record in the system. For the Form 471, if you scroll down, uh, the last section on that first page is for generated documents, and the original version link is the certified PDF copy to keep for your records. So I will now um, return to the presentation. I'll just take a moment to restart uh, the slides. Uh, just a moment, I have to scroll through a lot of slides to get this to go back to the page that I needed. There are over 140 slides, so it does take a moment. I do apologize. Okay, almost there. Oh my gosh, I really have fewer slides. I've already covered that portion. And then uh, we'll briefly talk about a few of the things before we wrap up. I do want to mention that after you've certified a form, you do have the option to submit some modifications. So if some of your entity information was incorrect, if you realized you made a mistake, some kind of data entry error, or your service provider told you, actually, you got the type of connection wrong that needs to be fixed, you can submit modifications to your application to ask your reviewer to take care of that. The navigation on that is not the best, so I highly recommend that you contact me for an appointment so we can work on those modifications together. And this just shows that you know, you're going to be going to your Form 471 record, and you can look under the Related Actions tab of your record for an option to submit a modification request. And keep in mind that review can begin right after you file your Form 471, even the same day in some cases. So it's possible that reviewers will need additional information to approve your application. You'll receive an email that will direct you back to the E-Rate Productivity Center to answer their questions. The most common one, actually, is for the Bookmobile Hotspot Service. Since that's generally month to month, the reviewer is going to want to ask uh, for a copy of a recent monthly bill to show those eligible data charges. You may also get questions about cost allocations, category two. Um, if you've got a new branch that you've never listed before on a funding request, you'll get asked for a letter indicating that that entity is eligible. And that's something that I will take care of for you. Just let me know and I'll create that letter that USAC wants to see. And here is an example of what uh, the review emails look like. This is hot off the presses. This is an email we received this morning. And then for the funding commitments, uh, we're expecting USAC to start releasing waves of funding commitments in mid to late April. So the application filing window closes on March 22nd, and it's generally three to four weeks before we start seeing those commitments. So when you get a funding commitment, it will be when your entire application has been approved, you'll get an email with a funding commitment decision letter attached to it. That will show the full amount approved for the application. If you file more than one application, you will get more than one funding commitment decision letter. There'll be a next step after that, but we'll worry about that in April, May, and June. We'll talk about the 486 later. And just a reminder for document retention, save everything for at least 10 years after the last date for service in the funding year. So this would be all the forms you file 
bids you received, both winning and losing, your bid evaluation, your contracts, your invoices for service. You're going to keep everything for at least 10 years after the funding year ends. So for funding year 2022, we're talking about keeping things until at least June 30th of 2033. It's a really long time. Briefly for the wrap up section. Uh, for additional resources, you can look at KDLA's E-Rate pages, go to the main schools and libraries or E-Rate program website. You can contact USAC customer service, and there's a pretty good newsletter from E-Rate Central you can subscribe to. You can also sign up for the Kentucky Tech Listserv to get reminders about important deadlines. I put a lot of reminders about E-Rate on there. The recording of today's presentation will be available both in Blackboard, but also on our archived webinars page. Look for the E-Rate section. And then thank you very much for attending today. My contact information is there. Um, and if you've got some time, please complete um, the survey for this particular webinar. This information helps KDLA improve its training and also provides data that we to our funding authority uh, for federal funding, which is the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Thank you very much, and good luck with all things E-Rate. Okay, Kim, uh, recording has stopped. <laughs> we don't have any questions from anybody attending unless you have some E-Rate questions. Uh, so I think we're good to go. Um, I'll hang out in this room for another 30 seconds, but um, otherwise we'll be in contact about that subtitle file. So thank you very much for sticking around today. I really appreciate it.